Dear friends, good to have you again tonight. We are going to be having an exciting time today in our house to house. Last week, we started off by talking about the altar of God. And today, we're going to build on that. As a matter of fact, for the next um, you know, couple of weeks, we'll talk about the altar of God, unpack it, and see its relevance in our lives, see its application in our discipleship uh, encounter and experience with God, and see how that can uh, help us in our understanding of biblical truth and our expression of our Christian values and Christian um, uh, attitude and lifestyle in this world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We pray that, Lord, as we get into your word once again, you will minister and speak to our hearts, O oh God. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now, today, I'm going to, um, I'm going to start by talking about um, um, Hezekiah, um, Manasseh again. Manasseh, this young man, I hope I didn't talk about Hezekiah the last time. It was Manasseh, I meant to say. Manasseh, this young man who was born by a godly Hezekiah, and this young man who strayed away, and he planted his own wild seeds. And of course, guess what? He, get, he got his own wild uh, oats, um, harvest, um, wild uh, offspring as, as harvest. Now, man, um, Second Chronicles chapter 33, the Bible says, it says, Manasseh, chapter 33 from verse 3, Manasseh rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images, and he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. In verse 5, he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Manasseh was building altars. He was building altars. He built altars, pagan worship. He built altars of horoscopy like some of you today are still doing. You are practicing horoscopy. Manasseh built altars for pagan worship. Now, some of you will say, well, I am not worshiping Satan. I am not worshiping idols. But there are idols in your life. What is an idol? An idol is anything you have elevated above your God. Some of you, you, you have the altar of fashion. So you worship on the altar, uh, on the shrine, in the shrine of your closet. Some of you is the altar of finance. So you worship at the shrine, the shrine of your bank account. Some of you is the altar of your relationship, your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend. So you worship at the shrine of that relationship. Some of you is the altar of academics. And so you worship at the shrine of books and knowledge, acquisition of knowledge. Some of you is the, shrine, is the altar of uh, entrepreneurship or business. So you worship at the shrine of making as much money as possible beyond and besides God. Now, there's nothing wrong. With any of those things, there's nothing wrong with good fashion. There's nothing wrong with relationship. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with, you know, having a good understanding about how to interact and relate with one another. But when you elevate anything above God, that becomes an idol in your life. So you are worshiping on the altar of finances, the altar of relationship, the altar. Some people, their altar is their children. And that was why God tested Abraham, for instance. He wanted to find out whether Isaac had become an idol in his life. So God reached out for Isaac and said, give me your son, your only son, the one whom you love deeply. And Abraham was willing to lay that on the altar of God. My dear friend, it's important that we have an altar for God. Manasseh was building altars to idols. And the Bible says that this provokes God. But when he turned around, now he built an altar. He built two altars. And I believe that he began to also, or perhaps he built one altar upon which he was servicing God. He was serving God on that altar. Because, for instance, in every local church, there is an altar. The altar is where the, the leader uh, preaches from. The altar is where uh, music comes out from. But the altar is not just where the leader ministers from. The altar is the, is the place of authority. Is a place of power. Is a place where the expressions of God's word, the expressions of the diversities of the gifts and the workings of the spirit of the living God can touch and reach lives. The altar is a place where impartation emanates from. It is that place where the power of God on the altar brings transformation upon the lives of the people in every local church. So as a rule within the local church, we service the altar of God within that local church. But let me not talk about that today. Let me talk about an area of, uh, of service, that um, an area of our work with God that has been very, very deficient for many others. Now, the Bible says, when Manasseh returned to God, he built an altar upon which he sacrificed peace offerings 
and thanks offerings. He gave peace offerings and thank offerings on the altar. And then he commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. He commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. To serve the Lord God of Israel based on the instructions and the stipulations coming from the altar. Now, peace offering, thanks offering, all kinds of offering, uh, first fruit offerings, uh, vow offerings, well, they were all put on that altar. But beyond that, the Bible says he commanded Israel to serve. And service to God and service to humanity is an area where people are deficient in. Christian believers are deficient in. The Bible said that he commanded Judah, he commanded Judah to serve. The word for serve the, the original word, the Aramic word, it means to labor, means to work hard, means to um, engage in extraneous labor, in strenuous labor. That's what it means. So when you serve God, now, now the, 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 uh, uh, an example of that word is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, uh, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as long as you know that your labor is not in vain. Look at the word labor. Serve. He commanded Judah to serve. Your labor, the word serve is labor. And Paul says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as long as you know that your labor is not in vain. When you serve God, when you labor for God, you are servicing the altar of God. When you labor for God, you are either servicing the altar of God within the four walls of the church building, your sanctuary, or you are servicing the altar of God in your life. Because as a disciple, you are supposed to serve the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your spirit, and everything within you. When you serve, you are servicing the altar of God. And serving is one area where Christians have become deficient. They've become defective. People don't want to serve God. They don't want to serve in a local environment where there are guidance and guidelines on how to serve God. Serving is important. Now, there's a man who exemplifies this service, this service to God and serving God in, in the Bible. And his name was Daniel. The Bible says, when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, the Bible says that the king came that night, and in fact, the king was so bothered. And this is what the king said in Daniel chapter 6. He says, he said, Daniel, in fact, when they were going to throw him into the lion's den, the king said to him, he says, he said, Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Verse 16. He said, the God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Question number one, which I think some of you should be thinking about, is how often do you serve God? Do you serve him inconsistently? Do you serve him discontinuously? Do you serve him when the times are good, in summer or in winter, when it's cold? Do you serve God only when you have a crisis in your life? Daniel was prime minister. Daniel was a political leader. Daniel, yet he served God continually. There are some of you who have not learned to serve continually. As you rose through the rank of your profession, as you rose through the rank of your financial um, strata, as you rose through the rank of your social network and net worth, you stopped serving God. You became um, inconsistent, an inconsistent believer. You became an inconsistent disciple. Now, but Daniel was serving continually. And ways in which he was serving was that he came around every now and again with his other uh, um, Jewish um, Christians or Jewish uh, believers, Jewish godly men in, in, in Babylonian ca captivity. And they spent time to pray and to praise and to seek the face of God. He served continually. Now, when he was thrown into the lion's den and the king came the following morning to check out whether Daniel was still alive, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says that when the king, verse 19, it said the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able 
to deliver you from the lions? Has the God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Look at this. Daniel, servant of the living God. It's important for you to realize that nowadays, who are the people we call servants of God? We say man of God. You know, uh, Pastor Joe is a man of God. Uh, Pastor John is a man of God. Uh, Pastor Daniel is a man of God. Pastor XYZ is a man of God. So we call the man of God, which is another word for the servant of God. And sometimes when we pray, we say, hey, if I be a man of God, if I be a servant of God, you know, let so so so, so thing happen. But Daniel was a politician. He was not a pastor. He was a political leader. And that brings me to this very important point. My friend, regardless of your profession or your designation in this world as a believer, you can be called a servant of the living God. Daniel was so authentic and so authoritative and so consistent in his work with God that the king could say servant of the living God. The king knew. So in political circles, they knew that Daniel was a servant of the living God. And in fact, you remember, that was the basis for which he was thrown into the lion's den in the first place anyway, because his fellow um, ministers and fellow officers, they came together and said, this man will not do, we cannot find anything wrong in this man except in the service of his God. So my dear friend, I want to ask you, the people you work with, do they know you're a servant of the living God? Daniel was serving. He was serving. I can imagine if Daniel was a member of the local church, Daniel could have been something in that local church, either in finance or in ushering or some, you know, doing something. Jimmy Carter is 100 years old now, um, the, the 39th president of America. That man, after he left the presidency, he returned to Plains, Georgia, and he was there serving in his local church. He was a Sunday school teacher. I, I thought I would have the time, the opportunity to go listen to him teach. I couldn't, but I remember one of our uh, church members here, Femi Fallow, went to uh, Plain Georgia to go and listen to, um, uh, to Jimmy Carter teach. He was a servant of the living God from the White House to the local church, a servant of the living God. My dear friend, I want to challenge you today. I, I, I want to, I beg you with all of my heart. You can be a servant of the living God. You are an accountant, but you're known as a servant of the living God. You're an Uber driver, you're known as a servant of the living God. You're a nurse, you're known as a servant of the living God. You are a school teacher, you're known as a servant of the living God. You're a student, you're known as a servant of the living God. And that places a burden on every one of you to make sure that you live right. Because if, for instance, you are doing something that is wrong, and meanwhile, your friends have known you as a servant of the living God. You will know that there is um, there is um, there's some kind of um, a dichotomy between the, uh, your identity and your action. So quickly, that you have to make a decision to reconcile your identity with your action. I appeal to you today, as we get into our discussion today, we, we need to answer this question. What are the ways in which I can serve my God? in a way that it impacts and challenges others and motivates them to want to know this God that I serve. In what ways can I be such a strong and a powerful witness in my service that people will know that I'm a servant of the living God regardless of my training, my profession, my label, my occupation. God bless you as we get into this conversation. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time. I pray that, Lord, you stay our hearts and grant us the authenticity and the candor to have a frank discussion. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.